Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Whedon. I'm glad to be back here for day two of our summit. This morning, we are kicking things off with a topic that has become something that's extremely salient in the policy world these days, and that is destructive anti-satellite testing and the impact it has on the space environment. Since 1959, four countries have conducted tests that have destroyed satellites and created thousands of pieces of orbital debris that persisted for years and even decades afterwards. This behavior threatens our current and long-term ability to access and derive benefits from space. And it's prompted calls in some areas for a ban or restraint on testing. For those who haven't yet seen it, uh, we have on the side table printed up poster sizes of our anti-satellite testing infographic released a few weeks ago. Um, and for those who are really nice to me, I think I might have a few hard copies of our global counterspace report still available. This panel is going to talk about why an anti-satellite test ban is important, how it might take shape, and why something like that is possible now, and how it fits into other discussions on responsible behavior. To set the stage for our discussion, um, I'm pleased to welcome Dan Oltrogi. He's director of the ComSpot Corporation, and he's going to give us a short overview of the space debris impacts from anti-satellite testing. So, Dan, the floor is yours. Turns out that ice is slippery, if you're wondering. And so it's a pleasure to be here. Um, this is something we've spent a, a bit of time analyzing, the Russian ASAT test specifically, but you'll see we'll do at the end a comparison with some of the other, um, other ASAT tests that, that Brian just mentioned. Uh, let's see, there's my mouse. So uh, I want to just say before we get into the ASAT stuff, this is the backdrop of, of LEO conjunction assessment already. Apart from ASAT activities, in just the last five years, our research has shown that conjunctions have increased fivefold, just in five years. And that's because we track more objects now and because there's a lot more active satellites. So ASATs are just another uh, element to this. The ASAT test itself uh, happened on 15 November last year. Um, you can take on the right here, you can take these, this plot. Uh, each of these lines represents a debris fragment that is actually tracked. Well, you can propagate those backwards, and you can find out when they come together. That tells you when the actual fragmentation event happened and that's this, this red triangle here. Some people tend to think that you can, uh, you can do a shoot down, you can kind of control where the debris goes, but I can tell you, and, and based on our research on the, on the left plot, that shows the velocity directions of the fragments. And you can kind of see it looks like a stocking cap little fuzzball. It, it's going in all directions. So um, that, the point there is that uh, as was mentioned yesterday in yesterday's panel, debris goes in, in all directions and affects other orbit regimes. It doesn't stay where that uh, event happened. We've also been tracking the number of released uh, state vectors and, and uh, orbit, uh, you know, orbit TLEs for each of the fragments. And, and this plot shows as a function of time, with the red star being where the, the fragmentation happened, the black line shows how many fragments were ever tracked from this event. And the red line shows how many are there today. And this was updated last week. So you can see that objects are re-entering. That's why the red line is dropping. But there are still 750-ish uh, fragments on orbit. Now, this is a simulation of the, um, of the engagement scenario. You can see the interceptor coming up here. This is a notional um, uh, representation. It's not perfect, but I think it gets to the heart of where fragments can go. And you'll see here a, a cloud of fragments from the interceptor and another cloud from the Cosmos 1408 uh, satellite. The colors of these volumes 
denotes where fragments could go, and, and the, the scale here shows the likelihood that they will go there. So you can see this color went from red to yellow. Now it's going to start going to green now over here as the volume of space occupied by these fragments expands. And just to point out, satellites are flying through this volume. So they have some uh, non-zero likelihood of, of collision. OK, so it, you can take this volume and kind of aggregate it over a day or a, a week or a month. And uh, this is an aggregation over 24 hours. You can see the volume of space that the fragments could occupy. You can see that where the interceptor happened, intercept happened, it's red. That means it's likely the fragments are coming together there. And 180 degrees away, there's a, what's called a pinch line where things have to come back together because the orbit planes uh, have to come back. You can then take that volume and you can fly the satellites through it. And you can kind of integrate the likelihood that that satellite would have a collision. And this is a, a rank ordering of the top 50 satellites that were put at risk. And you probably can't read all this text down here, but uh, note the, uh, that the ISS was number 14. Um, and it is such a huge object in space that that helps it be uh, put at risk. Uh, but there are satellites from every country down in this list here. And there's basically two conditions for why you are put at risk. You're either flying through a lot of the volume, or you happen to be intersecting like this orbit plane shown here. You happen to be flying through right at where the intercept happened or, or 180 degrees away. Now let's talk about the relevance to operators. Um, this plot here is expanded on the left, so let's just start there. But it shows as a function of altitude um, the collision probability for, for three categories. The orange is active satellites against the, the uh, debris. And not, this is not ASAT debris. This is just the population of debris. Blue is active on active satellites. But the new category is this gray here. This is active satellites on Cosmos 1408 debris. And you can see that it, it uh, affects all orbits um, well up into the 650 altitude, even though the test was down much lower. And you can also see that some, in some orbit regimes, the increase in conjunction risk or collision risk is 20% or more. The sobering part is that this gray stuff is going to decay. So as it gets lower and lower, it's going to be, then be affecting the ISS more and more. Now, we found a, a quite a sobering condition in early January from this, um, whereby the orange debris plane is intersecting with some of the Earth observing uh, satellite systems. They tend to use a sun synchronous orbit. And what we realized then is that the inclination of the target, 82.3 degrees, is exactly the complement of the inclination of a sun synchronous orbit of 97.7-ish degrees. What that means is that these orbit planes are going to process or, or regress, and twice a year they will be coplanar and counter-rotating. So it's basically like driving down the freeway in the opposite direction of traffic. And because of that geometry, you end up having a lot of collision risk. This is what we call it now a conjunction squall. And looking over the year, you can see a hundredfold increase in conjunction rates at certain points of year when these planes overlap. You can, you can do this analysis for all the satellites. And we looked uh, in particular, uh, this, if you look on the left, this is a missed distance criterion we're using. And you can see that a lot of the CubeSat constellations are getting hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of, of conjunctions per day. Um, and, and this breaks down the various constellations and how much they're getting in, in terms of uh, conjunction risk. The, the gray down here, that is our backdrop. So that's the conjunction or collision risk against non-ASAT debris. 
So you can see that this ASAT event is making it maybe five times higher than the normal background in terms of collision risk in this April spike. The black is all of the non-CubeSat stuff. It it's, it's, uh, tends to be more the military or the uh, civil expensive programs, very expensive programs. Now that is from a missed distance perspective, but you can also look at collision rates. When you look at the object sizes of what's coming together, CubeSats are very small, so they have less risk. Now you can see this is dominated more by Starlink, which is in green here, and the black, which is again the military and, and uh, expensive uh, civil, like NASA programs. So now, who has been affected by this test? Well, I just said, it's CubeSats and it's uh, larger Earth observing systems. But it's also other operators in non-Sun uh, synchronous orbits. ISS itself has seen a 33% increase in conjunctions. And now let's go through the news. What, what events have been kind of highlighted? Well, they had to go into their safe haven mode for the ISS right after the collision. Um, and then here's a, a bunch of things. This is a uh, uh, China uh, experienced a conjunction with the debris. Here's a commercial operator of a very expensive uh, Earth observing system saying that they are seeing uh, quite a few, a tenfold increase actually in conjunctions. And then there are many others, uh, a lot of ISS conjunctions and maneuvers they've had to do. Ma imagine maneuvering this, this huge uh, space station and the, the cost involved. Likewise, Starlink has seen some, um, some plus ups in not just their collision risk, but also because they have an automated maneuvering system, a, a high uh, increase there. Now let's kind of generalize this. We've talked about the Russian ASAT, but this is not our first fragmentation event, right? So you can see in this plot, uh, the Chinese ASAT test. There's also a Iridium Cosmos event, and this is showing you in a spatial density perspective how things have changed over time. This table is looking at the, the kind of the four major, more recent ASAT tests. And you can see the altitudes that they happened. The Chinese ASAT was, was at 856 kilometers, so quite high. And it's also at a high relative velocity, as shown here. And you have thousands of fragments coming from that and a th you know, thousands still on orbit. There's a USA-193 uh, uh, shoot-down event. There's an Indian ASAT. These are at much lower altitudes. And again, people talk about shooting from above and how that changes the debris field and where it goes. It does slightly, but really it's more about if you, these tests being at a lower altitude tends to self-cleanse uh, much faster. Then this uh, most recent ASAT test is over here. It's a lower velocity, um, but it's at uh, a higher altitude again. I also compared this against Iridium Cosmos, and uh, Iridium Cosmos was quite a serious test. It's not an ASAT test, sorry, it's not a test but it is an accidental collision, but it had a lot of fragments that, that came from it. And then lastly, I just wanted to show this video. This is spatial density starting uh, right before the ASAT test. This band of debris is the Russian ASAT, um, the Cosmos uh, 1408 debris. And um, you might have noticed it took some weeks before the public catalog even reflected that those fragments existed because they had not been either tracked or publicly released yet. Okay, so what are the next steps? It was already mentioned that um, the, the ASAT tests are a pressing threat to our safety and security and sustainability. The U.S. government has taken a lead in unilaterally saying that they're not going to conduct such kinetic uh, uh, ASAT tests. So that's all great. Um, Canada has now joined this ban. Uh, we would, you know, the, I, I'm sure the global community would love to see more and more countries uh, take this step. Um, and uh, last thing I'll tell you is that some of the analyses that I've shown in here are based on a tool called NEAT. It's a number of encounters analysis tool. It allows you to assess how frequently objects come together. It's freely available. Anybody can go use it um, on this website here. So thank you very much, um, and uh, 
I don't know if there's time for questions, but I assume not. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. We're going to seat our panel. We're going to get on with the discussion, please. So thank you, Dan, uh, for that excellent technical overview of some of the complications and implications from NS satellite testing. Um, I'm now going to introduce my panelists who are going to take the discussion further about what do we do about this. Um, uh, first, I'm going to introduce on the far right, Clive Hughes. He's the head of space security and advanced threats um, at the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Uh, prior to this, he has international, uh, he was the international ocean strategy manager covering a range of environmental security and science policies related to the oceans. Uh, next to him is Amundeta Azcarate Ortega. She's the associate researcher in the Space Security and Weapons of Mass Destruction programs at the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research. Her research focuses on space security and missiles, and she's currently leading UNIDIR's participation in the open-ended working group on space threats, which we're going to talk about here uh, in more detail. Uh, next to her is Jessica Talk. She's the Civilian Space Policy Analyst in the Office of the Secretary of Defense, which develops policy guidance, provides advice, and oversees planning, development, and operational implementation across the U.S. Department of Defense. Her por portfolio includes international affairs and multilateral governance, which includes serving as a U.S. delegate to the United Nations. Um, on my other side uh, is Nivedita Raju, She's a researcher at the Stockholm International Peace and Secure, sorry, in Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, where she conducts research on space security and gender issues. She also conducts research and outreach for disarmament education. Uh, and finally, on the end, we have Sabrina Alam. She's currently working at SES Satellites, developing, implementing, and driving the environmental, social, and governance ESC, ESG strategy. She has a background in physics and previously worked at NASA Goddard and the European Space Agency before specializing in sustainability. Uh, as we did yesterday, please use the Whova app uh, to submit questions and please make sure you're on this panel so I can go ahead and see them. Um, Nevi, I wonder if you can get us started by summarizing where the multilateral discussion on space security stands today. What has changed from what has happened in the past um, or has not changed? Thank you, Brian, and thank you to Secure World and to the UK Space Agency for the invitation. Very grateful to be here. Um, maybe I'll provide a bit of background first as to how we got to this stage at the multilateral level. Space security discussions are not new. They've been conducted for decades now can be traced all the way back to the formation of the UN Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, which resulted in the adoption of the Outer Space Treaty in 1967. And as many of you here know, the treaty imposes certain conditions and restrictions on activities on how to explore um, and use outer space. And this includes Article 4, which prohibits the placement of WMD in orbit, and also imposes certain conditions on activities on the moon and other celestial bodies. But, and this is what I argue is a major flaw with the Outer Space Treaty, is that there were no follow-up mechanisms after this. And as a result, following its adoption, national policies began to shift, priorities began to change, military competition increased, and the potential for escalation and conflict started to become very real. So there was a need to prevent an arms race in outer space. Um, this was adopted, Paros, as an agenda item at the <coughs> sorry, at the, at the Conference on Disarmament. And um, the UN General Assembly has adopted annual resolutions on PAROS since. But progress at the multilateral level on space security has been extremely challenging. And that is largely owed to two emerging views, which we've heard a little, uh, a little about yesterday as well on one of the panels. The first believing that legally binding treaties, which focus on banning weapons in space, that that should be the need of the hour. 
and the other view, which considers that existing frameworks can suffice, that we can build new measures, which can start with voluntary measures based on these frameworks, and that the focus on weapons in space is rather misguided. So while multilateral discussions were essentially stuck, the space sector has continued to evolve. Actors and stakeholders are diversified, technology is rapidly advancing, and among these, these developments are, of course, the developments of counter space um, capabilities and weapons testing, including destructive ASAP tests. And so I would say what's been changing is that there's a very urgent need for intervention at the multilateral level now. We've been stuck for about 40 decades, 40, 40 years, well, let's hope it doesn't go to decades, for about 40 years now. And there's a very urgent need to overcome this. And so to spur discussions at the multilateral level, the UK introduced um, an initiative through the General Assembly, that is Resolution 7536, which has resulted in the creation of an open-ended working group on uh, reducing space threats through norms, rules, and principles of responsible behaviors. And notably, the resolutions and the open-ended working group, they do not adopt a divisive either-or approach um, these focus on norm building, on voluntary measures, and do not rule out a legally binding treaty. And there is a focus on regulating behaviors rather than capabilities. So I would say what has, been, what has been changing, and this is what makes me a little optimistic, is that states and stakeholders are all slowly recognizing that these are, that these are not contradictory approaches, that voluntary measures and uh, norm building and legally binding treaties are actually compatible with each other, and given that we are at a stage where the trust deficit is so low, where confidence has deteriorated, we can start with voluntary measures and perhaps we can finally reach a place where, where, where we can adopt a legally binding treaty. So we're stuck, but it's, the discussions are, quite, are still quite uh, challenging, but let's hope that there's, a, that there's a way to overcome these through this, these changing attitudes. We're stuck, but at least we're talking, right? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, so Jessica, I'm gonna turn to you now. Uh, the United States recently announced uh, that it would no longer conduct uh, direct, NS, direct descent anti-satellite NS, missile tests. Um, I think that was a pretty big deal. Um, can you talk about how the United States government arrived at that decision, and was there anything that changed that made that possible now as opposed to in the past? Yeah, absolutely. Um, again, Brian, thanks so much for the uh, introduction introduction and ability to be on the panel today with uh, such great colleagues. I was joking earlier that this is like a mini OEWG that is occurring up here. Um, all of these folks, for the most part, were at the OEWG and will continue uh, being there in, in rather, you know, uh, participants, capacity, etc. cetera. Um, yes, thanks so much. Uh, so on behalf of the United States government, you know, we've been We've been tracking this for a long time. And, and Dan, as Dan said earlier in his speech, there's, there are so many things that are happening in the space environment, right? And as, as you've heard over and over over the last couple of days, there's new technologies, there's, there's novel uses, there's uh, the commercialization of space that has never been um, seen before. The barriers are lowering, we have more space actors. The United States military actually has an interesting view on that, which is because we actually track all of these things. And as many of you know, we provide the US space catalog, all of these tracked objects on spacetrack.org. So we've been seeing this, you know, we've seen the collisions, we've seen Iridium Cosmos, we've seen the increase, uh, the rapid, rapid increase over the last 20 years of uh, new actors, uh, promising new technologies, and we're helping people with collision avoidance. But when you see the rise of anti-satellite, destructive, direct ascent anti-satellite missile tests, things like the Chinese Fengyun 1C, things like last year's uh, or 2021's Russian ASAT tests, these are, for us it was, you see it as a deliberate choice to create destruction, right? This is a deliberate choice on the behalf of governments um, to essentially pollute the this, this space environment. And so while we've been talking about responsible behaviors for the last two years, really this, uh, the Russian 2021 ASAT test showed us it has, to, it has to end, right? At some point, you cannot pollute the space environment for so long. We're endangering ex explorers, we're endangering commerce, we're endangering um, long-term exploration, uh, trying to get to Mars. 
how can you do uh, how can you do space exploration if you can't even get out of low Earth orbit? Right. Mm -hmm. So in the U.S. government, there was a recognition of this, and it really was a catalyst to say, okay, instead of banning the technology, where are we going to go? What is the behavior that we want to stop? And that behavior in this case, one of the easiest behaviors we could come out with, you know, right before the OEWG, was essentially, well, we, the United States, and we hope others join us, can commit to not conduct destructive, direct ascent, anti-satellite missile testing. That is a deliberate choice. You do not need to create um, that level of debris to destroy the environment. Um, it's about long-term sustainability. It's about responsible behavior. And so that is really what has changed in the last few years. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, Clive, uh, obviously and thankfully the United Kingdom has not done an anti-satellite test before. Um, but you've been involved in this issue, as we talked about earlier, right? The UK sponsored the resolution that led to this open-ended working group. Um, how does how is the UK approaching this issue of, of, of satellite testing specifically, but space security more generally? Yeah, so uh, thank you, Brian. Yeah, I think if, if the UK didn't have a position on this uh, today, uh, this seat would have empty because after seeing Dan's presentation, I would have rushed back to the office to urgently, <laughs> uh, urgently create one. But, we, we definitely sort of welcome the, uh, the US commitment we, and for all the reasons uh, Jessica has stated and, and we've seen clearly presented by Dan. And so I think for us, it's got to be you know, f uh, f at the forefront of the, of the kind of responsible behaviors that we're trying to um, uh, persuade countries to sign up to through the UN open-ended working group uh, process. I think, you know, it's, it's, I think this kind of space debris issue is just one facet of a deeper issue in which kind of humanity's amazing and beneficial technological progress is actually now at a point where it could be harmful to the future progress. And so there is a real need, and I think an increasing recognition that we need to come together, you know, on, on whether it's space debris or climate change or biodiversity or pollution, these are all facets of the same fundamental issue, and we, and you know, I think, you know, we, we need to, as a sort of international community, understand that and sort of grab this transitional moment in hi human history to kind of address these issues. It, it's got to be doable, we think. Yeah, well, well hope so. Um, Amu, could you sum? We talked about this open-ended working group a couple of times. Um, could you summarize what happened at the first meeting? Uh, last month, and, and did this notion of an anti-satellite test ban or moratorium come up, and what kind of support do you think uh, there was for it? Okay, absolutely. Thank you, Brian, and also thank you to the Secure World Foundation and the UK Space Agency for organising this event and for having me here. Um, to provide a bit of context, uh, this OEWG has a specific mandate, um, and it's divided into four items, so to say. The first is to take stock of uh, the legal and normative frameworks that currently exist uh, in order also to be able to identify the gaps that also exist. Uh, the second thing that it's uh, mandated to do is um, think about the threats to space systems. Um, the third thing is to make recommendations on possible norms, rules and principles of responsible behaviours. And the fourth thing is to uh, draft a report to provide to the uh, General Assembly uh, during next year's session. Uh, so during this first ses session, which happened last month, um, we uh, discussed the first item of this mandate, which was the taking uh, stock of uh, the legal and normative frameworks. And as Navy already rightly said, um, we do have space laws and space regulations they don't really say anything explicit about ASAP testing or debris creation. And this was a major gap that was identified by state in the OWG. And it's also been something that's been talked about uh, in, in the past in several instances. Um, so this, this is, in fact, one of the major concerns that states have been raising over, over the years. Um, and so it was defi definitely discussed. The, um, the US commitment, in fact, was noted by many states and it was welcomed by uh, many states as well. And um, 
Also, another thing that uh, was, was noted is that um, commitments are great, but the fact that the law does not establish any sort of prohibition or that we don't have any sort of idea in the law of how these sorts of acts have to be tackled is, you know, it's an important gap. Um, I think um, the closest thing, and I think some states alluded to this during the, the session of the OWG, the closest thing that we have in the law uh, that could hint at the fact that um, active, uh, sorry, that uh, deliberate debris creation is, is kind of a bad thing is uh, the Article 9 of the Outer Space Treaty, which establishes the um, GC of states to conduct space activities uh, with due regard for the activities of other state parties. Um, but as was noted by several states, we don't really have a lot of clarity of what, these, um, what this concept of due regard actually means. It's such a broad concept. Um, and so that's, that's partly why states haven't really made the link of like, um, a, a, um, a NASAC test is a violation of this due regard principle because we don't really know what due regard means. Um, so um, some states called for, for the need to, to clarify these, to, this, to, to bring more clarity to, to this issue. Um, and so, so going back to the US commitment, yes, this was uh, definitely um, a welcome development, I think, and uh, so did many, many states at this meeting. And in fact, Canada also, um, during the session of, of this OWG, they actually made their own commitment um, to not conduct uh, uh, these types of, of ASAP testings. Um, and um, they also, as the US also did, they, they expressed their hope that other countries would follow suit. I do have to point out, though, that um, some concerns were also raised. Um, um, first, there was the, the concern of, you know, commitments are, are great, and I think, personally, that any initiative that reduces uh, or seeks to mitigate debris creation is a step forward. Uh, but there is, you know, uh, some concern that maybe a commitment is not enough, that there, there is some desire by many states to have a binding ban on, on, on these types of tests. Um, also, some non-state actors have, have actually um, expressed this as well in several instances. And there is also the, the concern that if we seek to, to ban these activities, uh, what is this going to mean? for um, the development of technologies, um, especially of, of emerging space-faring states? Is this going to somehow limit the development? And so I think now it's important to, to, to find a way to, to ensure that such um, commitments or such uh, uh, initiatives to, to, to mitigate uh, debris creation or activities that lead to debris creation, I think is more accurate. Um, we have to find a way to ensure that this is done in a way that doesn't limit those, you know, really good initiatives or those really good technological developments that, that advance space exploration, that could advance uh, sustainability initiatives, etc. So this is a bit of a, of a summary of what happened <laughs> during that first session of the mm -hmm. AWG. Thank you. Um, Sabrina, I'm going to talk to you, return to you now. Uh, you work for a commercial satellite operator uh, who do business in space. Uh, I, in your, in your, how would the, does the commercial industry view this issue? Do, do they think that anti-satellite testing is a big deal? Do they see it as a big threat to their business? You know, can I give some perspective on that? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, debris is bad. Intentional debris is even worse. Um, so from a commercial uh, perspective, uh, it puts our business in danger. It puts our, um, I would say, our livelihood in danger as well. It really is quite negative, and so we do think it's a huge problem. We've advocated, we've, we've taken a stance, we've communicated to the world that we don't agree with this. Uh, we don't think that this is good for any reason. When you talk about uh, astronaut safety, when you talk about satellites, um, when you talk about space in general, this puts everything at risk. Um, and you know, for SES, we operate in MEO and GEO, and so uh, from Dan's presentation, you saw that there's a huge effect on the LEO 
um, satellites. But actually, you also saw that debris can go anywhere. Um, and so that cloud of debris also poses a threat uh, to satellites in MEO and GEO, and it poses a threat to the satellite industry, uh, whether it be military or whether it be private, whether it be wh whatever it might be. There is a huge threat there, um, both from a financial perspective. If we're talking about um, investors, if we're talking about insurers, if ASAT testing is to happen, you increase the risk of your satellite operating in orbit. That impacts a company heavily from a financial perspective because you're less likely to, or you're gonna have to pay more, essentially, because the risk is greater. Um, so there's that. Uh, from a non-financial perspective, you increase the workload of your employees. Every spacecraft operator is gonna have to work, and you saw Dan saying, almost a hundredfold. So there are real uh, problems with ASAT testing and debris in general. And where we're all trying to mitigate debris, uh, ASAT testing is just a threat to space sustainability in general. And so SES, the commercial sector, um, all satellite operators, and actually I think anyone who operates within the space environment is worried about what's to happen because the technological capabilities aren't good enough to also track every bit of debris, whether it be really big, whether it be really small. And so adding that to the risk just creates a bigger problem there. And so it's uh, all in all not, not a great thing. Um, and so we, we don't support ASAT testing. Uh, SES itself uh, and the CEO, Steve, have openly said we don't support it. And we want to work and collaborate with the industry to actually put a ban to this, to put a stop to this, and to control it in some way or another. Mm -hmm. Um, and following up on, on that one, there's a question here from the audience is to the, the, the consequences of the collision between two satellites in LEO, which Dan talked about, are about the same as an anti-satellite test. Um, both create a lot of debris. Yeah. Uh, that, and um, should we not be as concerned about the collision risk in general as we are about anti-satellite testing? I think I, I would answer that by saying I can think of far more conferences and workshops and papers and discussions focused at uh, collisions, like just you know, you know, accidental collisions, than I can about specifically what do we do about deliberate choices to destroy satellites. So I absolutely agree. There are they are both very concerning. Um, I think that what we're trying to do here is say we should think about this. As mentioned earlier, these are choices, right? The anti-satellite testing is a choice made by a government. It's not an accident. It's not something just randomly happened. I think that is makes it a little bit different. And I think that's why we're talking about that in addition to sort of the accidental collisions, which are absolutely um, important to deal with. Um, so, uh, Nevi, I wanna turn back to you. Uh, you've been working on this issue for, for quite a while. Um, you mentioned this a little bit, but can you expand? Are you optimistic or pessimistic that we're actually gonna, this time, make some progress on the space security issue and more specifically on the satellite testing issue? Um, and, and what gives you the greatest sense of hope or caution? I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. <laughs> so a bit of both, I guess. Um, well, and, and I think that, that that view is informed by the, the, again, by the urgency that I mentioned earlier, by the fact that these tests are increasing um, and, that, and that debris impacts everyone. Uh, I think, as, um, as, uh, as Almu mentioned earlier, both states and non-state actors have been quite vocal about this issue, even at the OEWG. If you look at many of the submissions, uh, destructive ASAT test has been highlighted in several of them, and even states which have been hesitant and, and didn't want to explicitly name them, you still see debris being named as a very real security concern. So there's obviously awareness of this issue, and I think, again, there is slowly, hopefully, I think there's, there's some growing recognition that there is no such thing as a responsible destructive ASAT test. It's not possible. Um, when we say that the effects of debris are, um, are indiscriminate, it's because if you as a state choose to conduct this test, there's nothing to say that the debris from your test is not going to interfere with your own space activities. Maybe it could, it could even hamper your economic growth, it could interfere with your military space activities, and it's affecting your private sector, as we heard from Sabrina earlier. Um, so I, I, I think that there is an, an appetite for this. Um, however, and here's the need for caution, 
there are states, again, as, as Alma mentioned earlier, uh, states from the global south who feel that such a ban, there should be a way to introduce this in, in a manner that does not impede their right to develop these technologies. Um, and learning from the past, I think that our objective, our intent, there are some who have questioned the, the US statement, um, so we need to be very clear about the intent and the scope of such a ban, and also the process. Um, making sure that it is extremely transparent and extremely inclusive, that all of these states are equitably um, invited to participate and help shape these discussions. And if we keep all of these factors in mind, then, then maybe. Then <laughs> maybe. And for those who work in this field, I mean, that, that is a ray of sunshine compared to where this discussion <laughs> has been for the last 30 years, uh, which is kind of, de kind of depressing. Um, Jessica, I want to go back to you. Um, you know, how does this discussion and a satellite testing uh, fit into the larger discussion and norms of behavior, which the U.S. government has been uh, uh, a leader on sort of pushing in the international community the last several years. Um, is, is this the main issue to focus on ASET testing, or are there other really high, you know, significant issues, uh, security issues, where you think there also needs to be a focus and discussion on? Thanks. Uh, yeah, as you guys heard, um, during the OEWG, the ASAT the anti-satellite missile ban was a, a big question. Um, you know, for the United States, this is an initial step, right? We have been talking about the need for responsible behaviors, the needs for norms of behaviors, for actually, it, it's been a really consistent drumbeat in US space policy for successive presidential administrations. So it's not as if we are changing our policy over time. What this is is showing that where can we go? We're looking for, you know, so as the other, as my other panelists said, there's kind of two trains of thought. One wants to, one set of countries wants to say, hey, let's go straight to legally binding. Let's go straight to treaties. Let's, let's talk about these things that uh, we can ban. Meanwhile, uh, while, we, while we lack confidence in other states, what we're looking at uh, from the United States side and some other like-minded countries is essentially, and what brought about the OEWG, as Clive mentioned earlier, was that realization that there are other methods to go about, right? There are other ways. It's not to say that you have to have one or the other, but it is really a continuum. You start with norms, and eventually you start with non-legally binding transparency and confidence building measures. And then eventually, yeah, maybe we do get to treaties, but we've got to take that first step. And so for us, the ASAT testing, uh, missile, missile testing ban, is essentially that first step to say, here's a behavior. It's not about technology necessarily, but it is about behaviors. It is about a country saying, you know what, we're not going to do this anymore. We think it's, we think it's really important. And so, um, and I'm gonna diverge just a minute here, but I, uh, even though I'm on, in the Department of Defense, right, uh, I get to go to, I'm, I'm looking at Nicholas here, who was one of our speakers yesterday. We don't only work uh, with, on the security side, right? Um, the US Department of Defense really works across the board for space sustainability, uh, responsible behaviors. So we are actually a huge player in the long-term sustainability guidelines, right? We were talking about, you know, because you look at things like, basic things like communication, and the interesting thing is, yeah, it comes up in UN COPLOS, it comes up as an LTS guideline, but when it doesn't exist on the security side, when you don't have risk reduction measures, you don't have risk mitigation, there's also the security aspect of it too. So there are a lot of complementary efforts between the two that we think we're trying to suss out now, right? And there's been a lot of work in COPLOS, and there's been a lot of work in the security areas, but we think that this is the time to start looking at, again, uh, the behaviors. So, we're really, really glad that the uh, UK took the initiative, really spearheaded the effort to do this OEWG because we think, as Almadina indicated, it'll be great to talk about those threats. It's, it's incumbent on us to build shared understandings between nations about what threats actually are, what are the risks, and then how do we reduce those risks through things like communication, through things like telling other people, look, we're going to stop this behavior, and this is just the first step. If others join us, then eventually maybe we can get to the point where there's enough widespread support that we can say, this is an international norm. This is something that we can take forward along the, uh, along the path to those legally binding measures. Thanks. Uh, and so, Clive, following up on that, I mean, the UK was original sponsor of this resolution and has been, been pushing for this. Um, what is your assessment of how the OEWG is going so far? Is it sort of 
I, we, we've talked about how it is the first ray of sunshine in quite a while, so that, that's, that's great. So w where do you think it's going? Do you think this might, come, might be something that emerges from those discussions, is this focus on satellite testing, or might there other issues that you think are gonna emerge from there? So I think we had a, a gentle start with the first OEWG uh, meeting because uh, I think all we were doing for that first meeting was examining what is the existing legal and normative framework that applies uh, to space. And so uh, it was a kind of a warm up really for, for what's to come. And, and I think what was positive from that meeting was, maybe it sh we shouldn't think of it as positive, but <laughs> it's a difficult issue. But uh, that, that, you know, almost all, all present believe, you know, that international law should applies to space as well as the space treaties, including international humanitarian law. Although I did note that Russia and China sort of declined to kind of go as far as that, accepting that. But mm. in general, there's a, a, a you know, a, a large body of opinion that kind of supports the sort of rules-based order in space. Um, I think other positive uh, things that I noted were there's, I think, a bit of an outbreak of pragmatism in, in some of the, the, the countries. So, as, as Jessica alluded to, it's been a somewhat polarized debate over the years, kind of legally binding arms control treaty versus kind of vol voluntary, um, voluntary rules. And I think now a number of countries, South Africa, Brazil, Mexico, I noted in their statements, were kind of accepting that the responsible behaviors approach is actually uh, has potential uh, to deliver some of the results that we want to see in terms of reducing space threats. And it doesn't necessarily exclude the possibility of uh, concluding legally binding um, uh, rules in, in the future. And the other thing I think I noticed is that a lot of countries are saying that any legally binding rules that do come in the future do need to be verifiable and, and kind of practicably implementable. So. I feel like um, the sort of conversation has uh, improved in that sense. Um, but it's going to be more difficult going forward. We're going to the next meeting discuss current and future threats to space systems. That is obviously a controversial <laughs> topic. And then we will, at the next one, actually try to get into de developing specific norms of behavior. Um, uh, so countries are going to be ready to put forward what's important to them. And there's a big diversity of, of opinion and uh, that we will need to sort of talk through. I think in terms of how it relates to the sort of a potential ban on destructive uh, ASAT testing, I mean, that is a clear, uh, making such a commitment is a clear responsible behavior. We'd like it to be included in the OEWG report if that was possible, but there, you know, there are other ways we could, we could do that. I think it's important to show other countries that we're not just focused on that. You know, we want to be addressing a range of threats to, to space systems. There are other threats to space systems that are also important uh, to us to address. And, you know, I think it's, we need to sort of show that good faith that we're, we're looking to address the full range of threats or to the extent that we can and have that conversation. And the final point I would make is that whatever we, come out with at the end of this uh, process, whether it's a list of norms or, or, or nothing, the process itself is the product, you know, so just having the conversation, help starting to build understanding of what we regard as threatening and sort of, you know, planting those seeds in, in the minds of other countries that that then might help inform future conversations, future processes. So we've got to have keep a long term view as well on this. So, so that, that phrase is the process is the product. I understand that, but I just want to unpack that a little bit for the, for the audience. It, it, it means that just having all these countries go through this process and thinking these issues through and developing positions leads to a better end state than we were when we began the process. Even if we can't quite get them all on this to agree to all the things that we wanted to have in the process, right? So it's that process of thinking through that, that is actually changing things and making things more positive, yes? Yeah, and, and, and I think obviously so, uh, some countries have more space, are more invested in space than others. So I think part of the process is in increasing the overall IQ of the international community on what the threats are, what the nature of those threats are and the consequences of that, and this can help with that. And so 
I think a lot of countries will come out of this knowing more than they did, you know, prior to the process. So that's all got to be sort of useful. So I want to pick up on one of the things you said about, about verification, and I want to tie that together um, with a question from the audience about holding nations accountable and open that to whoever wants to respond. How important is it that these commitments, whether they are voluntary, whether they're actually legally binding, are coupled with a way to verify that countries are abiding by them and there's a way to hold countries accountable? I know that happens in other re arms control regimes. How important is that as part of this process? Anybody want to touch on that? Um, well, I think, if again, making it a little bit narrower, when, when does verification come into play? That's when you have a very clear legal obligation. And if we manage to move forward with, um, with, any, with, a, with a measure pr that prohibits destructive ASAT tests, we do already have SSA technologies that can be used to verify whether these tests occurred or not. Um, and I think if we communicate clearly, what is the purpose of verification then for such a regime? It's not to deny the state that is conducting the test the benefit of having conducted this successful test. It's to inform the international community that a violation has then occurred. And after the Indian test, after the Russian test, we saw that this happened. Many states were already aware instantly. It's impossible to conceal such a visible activity. Um, so I think that verification, we do have the means to do so. It's more, I suppose, a question of timing, inviting the states first, following the process. And, and but we do have the means for verification for this particular measure. Mm -hmm. Else? Oh, go ahead and take this. Yeah, absolutely. From the United States perspective, this is the reason why we went with the anti-satellite, uh, the destructive direct descent anti-satellite missile testing, right? Because we said, we want something that the international community is able to verify itself. We don't want necessarily, you know, the United States provides a lot of information, the US military provides a lot of information, but we don't, we, we recognize that um, we may not be seen as an honest broker, right? We recognize that there are other, other views out there and that people say, okay, I don't necessarily want to rely on the United States information, but there's other information out there. There's, there's the rise of SSA uh, providers now. Um, you've heard from some of them. You've heard from Dan, who obviously took a lot of information together that wasn't necessarily all from the United States, right? It was not all based off US information. And so we said, verification through other means is important for other countries, that they can figure it out through their own sovereign means or through other methods that they trust. And so we said, look, when you see it, when you, it's, it's easier to see a missile on a tell. You see the missile go up, you see the cloud of debris occur, and I mean, it's, it's a lot easier to um, verify, right, that mm -hmm. a violation has occurred other than, you know, versus, well, you know, was there cyber activity? We're not entirely sure. Where did these things come from? Are they doing, you know, are there non-kinetic actions occurring? And these are things that you can't necessarily, you know, even if the US knows it, do others, can others see it? And so that was a really important part for us. And I will make one more comment, which is, um, it's a long-standing US policy that the U United States will consider arms control proposals. So we're not completely close to it. We will consider them, but they have to be uh, effectively verifiable, equitable, and they also have to uh, enhance the US national security interests. And so these are things that we evaluate every time that we're brought essentially in a, pro a proposal. And these are one of those things that we would look at again if this, uh, if, if this initiative were to go further. Um, and I think something else that you mentioned uh, is having the ability to see and, and, and identify this from multiple sources. That has really changed quite a bit in the last five, 10 years with the rise of commercial SSA providers, other countries developing their own national capabilities. Um, I think that is one of the things that has very much changed this. Um, and I'll just add that if you look at the, the history of nuclear arms control, the appearance of space-based verification for that, as in imagery satellites, uh, was I think an important precursor to the willingness of countries to sign up to things that they could then, they could then verify. So you can almost do a little parallel with some SSA things that are going on. Yeah, no, I just wanted to add to that because a key word you mentioned was accountability. Um, and from a commercial um, kind of point of view, accountability is really actually vital because what happens if uh, a piece of debris actually knocks out a satellite? 
What happens if our whole business model then gets completely interrupted? We can't provide services to our customers. We can't provide services, uh, you know, to to whoever it may be. That has a knock-on effect because then we are held liable for not providing that service. Um, and so accountability is really important because then, firstly, where does that flow of accountability come from? Who determines that? And then what are the repercussions of it? So those are really important factors that need to be considered when we talk about ASAT tests, when we talk about verification, when we talk about, in general, like intentional debris. And so um, from the commercial space environment, it's very, very harmful um, to our business, to the industry itself, um, because you know that that puts other organisations off. Uh, new space will be harmed. They would be reluctant to then step into that environment if they know that that risk is so large, um, and then no one will be held accountable. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to to throw that in there. So I, I want to I wanna pick up on that in a little bit, and and I'll ask you to start, but I, I, I want to get everyone else's opinions. Um, and, and it's going to tie together a couple of questions here that they're difficult questions, but I, I think they're important to bring in the discussion. Um, and that gets to, you know, the issue of collective action, holding countries accountable. Um, you know, there have been some countries that have spoken up. There have been some companies that have spoken up, but not all. And I, I kind of want to get to a, a discussion about why do we think there, that not all that many countries, or sorry, companies, for example, have publicly called out these tests or have endorsed uh, what the moratorium that the, that the US announced. Do you have a sense of why, that, why you think that might be? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, we should be calling it out. Does more need to be done 100%? Um, but I want to come back to the reason ASAT tests even exist. It's politically motivated. Um, with commercial companies, we have limited uh, kind of power over what countries want to do. We have limited power over kind of those key decisions that they make. What we can do is advocate best practice. We can, uh, within our agreements, mention that we don't support this and we expect that our customers, whether it be the US government or other governments, that they uphold what we believe is best practice, which is no ASAT testing. But how much power do we actually hold? And I think. That's been the deterrent um, of commercial organizations. They have spoken out and they realize actually it's not making a ton of difference um, at this point. However, when we see that the US has taken or banned ASAT testing, when we see that Canada then followed, you actually empower these organizations to do more and more and more. And so from our perspective, we want to partner with organizations. We want to collaborate with the industry to put forward, not a proposal, but you know, advocate for what we believe should be banned, which is the ASAT testing. Mm -hmm. um, we recently created an ESG strategy, so an environmental social governance strategy. And within that, one of our key pi pillars is space sustainability. And so what we're doing right now, and, and this is in particular to SES, and this is kind of the general trend within commercial organizations that operate within the space industry, we are fleshing out what space sustainability really means to us. Um, you know, there are so many different aspects and layers of it. Do we need to prioritize? Because of course, that focus also means a huge amount of resources, both financially, also uh, from a human point of view. And then in addition to that, um, you know, who, who then monitors it, who then leads it, is there a framework? And that's why we need to collaborate, not just commercial uh, space players, but actually we need to work with governmental organizations. We need to work with those big players that can make the key decisions about what should happen, what should be set. And that's what we do. We do play a role. We do, like I said, advocate for best practice. We do say what we need from our perspective. And what we want to see is a quicker, faster, more effective way of working. And that's not to criticize anyone. I think from our point of view, we really want to see change. You know, we, we don't just want to talk about it, we want to see it. Um, and like I said, commercial players are so open to doing this. They are so open to providing their inputs, their opinions. They want more opportunity to do that and get involved in these decisions. So anyone else input? Why, why haven't companies or governments been more outspoken on this? I don't know. Almo, you mentioned Article 9 is sort of a hook out there. I don't think I've heard any countries explicitly calling on that. 
Have you, yes, any that, ideas why, maybe? That's right. Well, I alluded to, to one reason before, which is the, the lack of clarity of what this concept means. And the OWG, in fact, uh, one of its missions, in a way, is to help um, create consensus, create common understanding on these issues. Um, so hopefully, you know, after this process, we will have a more clarity on, on a lot of issues, but this, this one specifically. But another reason why states haven't really been uh, vocal or haven't really expressed whether kinetic acid testing is an illegal action is because, and, and Sabrina, you mentioned this, it's because of political interest. Um, states have had a lot of freedom of action in, in space for a very long time, and this has been really advantageous uh, for them in a way, right? Um, I think it's, it's become more evident now with, with the increase of, of actors in space, both state and non-state actors, that such freedom of action, it, it does have advantages, but it also has disadvantages, and uh, perhaps more um, regulation clarity is needed, more uh, explicit regulations to, to kind of know how we, have, how we can act in space are needed. So, so I think that was the reason, but I do see uh, a certain shift. Um, and as for non-state actors, I, I completely agree with, with what you say, Sabrina, but I do think that um, non-state actors have a huge role to play in these discussions. And this is an open-ended working group, keyword open, so that means that everybody can participate. It is a state-led process, of course, but um, non-state actors can come, can speak and share their views, and I think it's key that they do so um, during this past session. We didn't really have that many um, um, non-state actors that took the floor, and I would encourage um, them to, to do so more in the upcoming sessions, because they have the technical know-how that sometimes states lack. Um, and also civil society, for example, they, they also play a huge role because they have this ability to connect industry with governments in a way that uh, few other actors can. Um, so I would encourage um, to reach out to civil society as well or to reach out to organisations and shameless self-promotion here to, to organisations like Unity who, who really work hard to be that nexus point between uh, the different actors because the, the end goal is to create that common understanding that will eventually lead to a more secure and sustainable space domain. So, so Jessica, tying into there's a question here whether or not private sector uh, statements uh, calling out these issues impact governments. Is, is, does is the U.S. government, do, they want, do you want to hear from the private sector what they feel about this issue? Do you think that has an impact on how governments approach it? Oh, absolutely. And so what I'll, what I'll and this is outside of ASATS, right, but what I will point back at, and Dan referenced this in his discussion earlier, which was the Iridium Cosmos collision. Prior to the Iridium Cosmos collision, the United States had, you know, the U.S. military kept all of our information. We had it, you know, we're, we have radars all over the world, we're, we're watching what's going on in space, and, you know, we weren't really compelled to share, share that information with everybody. Um, when Iridium Cosmos happened, and you, you saw, you know, like, it, it, was, it was this turning point where industry said, whoa, we thought this was the big sky theory. We were just flying, but oh my gosh, we're gonna lose billion dollar satellites. We can't handle this on our own. We don't have the space track information. We don't have the tracking ability right now. And this was you know, several, many years ago. Um, and they actually went to the government and they went to Congress and they wrote letters to the military and they said, help, help us, give us information. And the government said essentially, okay, Let's figure out how we can do it, right? Um, and so we had the rise of the Space Situational Awareness Sharing Program, right, which is still going today. You have spacetrack.org, where the US shares its uh, the military catalog, right? Um, and so yeah, yeah, we absolutely want people, we want commercial industries coming online and saying, this is great. You guys are looking at sustainability. You're taking sustainability seriously, even if you're the military, right? Like even if you're any part of the government, we need Congress, we need our politicals, we need everybody all working together towards this because it's, it's bigger than us, right? It's, it's, it's about sustainability long term. Thanks. Um, so Clive, I'll ask the same thing. Do you, you know, do you think the UK government cares about what its industry thinks on this issue? Um, and, and secondly, there's a question here. Um, 
you know, given the current geopolitical tensions, how do you engage with, uh, uh, you know, I'll use the phrase and uh, the question, non-like-minded countries in trying to have these discussions multilaterally? Easy, well, I really think I would just question, really easy question. Just there. refer to the the minister's statement. So I think yes, absolutely, um, and the sort of voice of industry's influence and the, some of the announcements he make is obviously speaking to that. So, um, but I, I think that that I think that the problem we've got is we need to sort of break out of the kind of commercial, the sort of limited co co commercial and civil society interest in space. If you go to these UN meetings, it's the same organizations every time saying the same things over and over yeah, again. The secure people show up. That's all, <laughs> that's, up. All, that's all valuable and good. But I'd like to see some of the big kind of like human rights organizations, environmental organizations who have a dependency on space data or other companies, but who are not necessarily part of the space community, kind of be engaged by the space community to say, look, you've got an interest in this, you need to speak up on this. And that's how you get the people involved, I think. And you need that kind of public pressure to ultimately get move forward, so. Uh, and any thoughts on how to work multilaterally with countries that may not be on the same page as, um, as the US and the UK? Well, I, th I think, you know, we, we have to use the traditional tools of diplomacy of multilateral kind of uh, discussions through the UN, but we need to supplement that with strong bilateral engagement, discussing uh, these. I mean, I think we need to mainstream kind of space security issues into our conversations with countries, because I, I think that has been, you know, uh, uh, something that we haven't done so much, uh, but we now need to increasingly do. So when we're having our kind of, you know, bilateral security dialogues with whichever country it is, space should be one of the agenda items, I think, you know, increasingly. So I think that, that's the sort of thing we should be doing. So I'm, I'm gonna close by asking each of you for uh, sort of what you think the, the highest priority thing is that we can do as a community to advance this issue. Um, is it making those connections outside of the, the little space bubble? Um, is it coming up with more specific proposals? Uh, kind of interested in any kind of ideas you might have. And I'll start on this end. Uh, Sabrina, any, anything you can come up with or leave us on? Oh gosh, you put me on the spot there. Um, no, I would say, um, you know, collaboration with all stakeholders within the industry. I think that needs to be improved a lot more in different mechanisms. Uh, also transparency, I think there's a lot of great stuff happening, but one thing is we don't know it. Um, you know, how do we get involved? You know, and I think it's who then uh, is kind of managing that. Is it us who need to go and reach out? Is it the organizations or the UN that need to then come to us? And so that's one thing I think, greater collaboration with all stakeholders. Uh, secondly, I think the industry uh, and especially the commercial industry, and I'm being biased here because I'm talking from a commercial uh, perspective, we need to come together and we really do need to find a way to uh, tackle this issue head on and have a stance on it uh, together as an industry. And I just wanna touch on something you said, You know, countries that might not have the same mentality that's where the commercial world can really play a role. Um, you know, whether it be Russian or Chinese organizations, they don't want their satellites blown up. They don't want their um, business models to be harmed. And I think internationally, the commercial world can come together and put forward a case. And that is probably the way in which we see a good route into actually uh, giving a perspective of the dangers of space with, um, governments that, again, have different thinking actually might listen to. Um, so those would be my two main takeaways there. Um, well, multi-stakeholder engagement, absolutely. But I, I also think that maybe a way to move forward is to approach the states that have not been as vocal, um, trying to fully understand why and maybe conducting more awareness raising on, um, on a bilateral level, and on a regional level. Um, I, again, I think that it's about about convincing states that everyone has a lot to lose here and that, that this is an issue that we actually can achieve agreement on. There's a reason why it was described as low-hanging fruit by many at this, at this OEWG session. It's because we can possibly achieve consensus on this issue. Um, but again, I think that's going to be with targeted effort and trying to be as inclusive as possible. It being a very political issue, trying to involve all of the actors, um, I think that's, that's the way we'd have to go forward. Yeah, I think from our perspective, 
you know, and, and I've been saying this the entire time, it's not about the develop, uh, it's not about the technology capability deve development, right? We hear from states all the time and they go, where are we gonna make that? We don't have missile defense capabilities. We're not gonna invest in those kinds of uh, capabilities. Like why, why do we even care about this? And uh, Navi said this, one of, the, one of the things that is really important, right, which is, but you benefit from space. But all of these people, as, as Clyde indicated, we have to indicate to them what the benefits of space are and then show them that, you know, effectively, those are threatened by debris. And so we said, you know, and it's not necessarily that you're going to create this capability or develop this capability. It is about using your voice as one of the United Nations member, as part of the international community, to essentially say, we've identified this as a norm. We've identified this as something that is so important to us that you eventually create the groundswell you know, of support that people go, no, this is a thing. This is a norm. This is something that we could take forward like the limited test ban treaties, right? The treaties that say, hey, we don't test uh, nuclear weapons in the atmosphere, in the air, in the water, in space, uh, in the, uh, right. And so is this one of those things that can move along, right? Is this one of those things that can move along that continuum? But we need more than just the United States and Canada. So as we're going out and doing our bilaterals and hopefully as others go out and talk about these same commitments, you could say, look, it's really important. If this commitment makes sense to you, if, if, it, if you read the words and go, this does make sense, it is low-hanging fruit, we, my country, my community, uh, my organization, my, you know, uh, wants, to raise, wants to raise our voice in support of this, that is how you get to a norm. That is how you get to something that is eventually, potentially legally binding. Mm -hmm. I would say, uh, may, first of all, participate in this process, this OWD, or, or any process like it. You have a voice, use it. Um, and uh, even if you didn't, if there are countries who didn't vote in favour of the resolution, they should still engage to make sure that their voices are heard. Why didn't you agree with that view? Uh, because the, the objective is to reach that consensus. And I think that's been something really positive in that first session of the OWG, that we had a lot of engagement. So that's, that's, that's really encouraging. Um, and also, I think Nevi was, was talking about this as well. Um, even if participation has to be diverse. So even if you don't think you have a stake in the game, you do. Even if you don't have any satellites up there, um, you do uh, profit from space services. So it is in your best interest to, to, to participate and to make your views known. And although you might not have a satellite now, you might in the future. So you want to ensure that the regulations that are created um, also benefit your interests in a way. Um, and also, uh, I think we sometimes focus on how can we create the next big thing, uh, which is great. Uh, but I think we don't always need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, I think it's also important to focus on uh, the laws, the regulations, the practices that already exist, and to see how these can assist us to, to achieve those goals. We can build, there is a, a big foundation already that exists that we should profit from. Clive, in closing. So uh, I guess just one practical suggestion, which is that the UN is hosting a summit of the future in 2023 to address the grand challenges facing humanity. Space dialogue is part of that, recognizing the importance of space. So I'd encourage all kind of civil society and commercial actors with an interest here to engage with that process, to make sure their voice is heard, you know, through that process and see if we can come up with some, you know, practical um, things to help sustainability in space. Great, okay. Well, please join me in thanking our panelists for the discussion. Um,